Um, so we're going to be talking about change today. Um, change is a big part of our industry. It's a big part of what's been going on in our industry for a long time. We have to get used to change, the ability to cope with change. Um, so we're going to go from a large scale change into personal change. Um, a lot of what I've been seeing this year is personal change, churn, um, a lot of different things happening with people I know. Um, Matt Darby wrote a blog post uh, talking about some of his journey, which he'll be talking about here. Um, so my name is Charlie Baker. Uh, I work for Groupon currently. I run the Denver office for Groupon. Uh, I've been in the industry for about 20 years. Uh, worked previously for uh, Facebook, worked as an independent consultant, um, and then worked at The Gap for a long time, as well as some other startups. Uh, met Cheesy at The Gap, actually. So first of all, what is change? What are we talking about here? Um, so we're talking about personal change. Uh, in order to affect other types of change, you need to be able to change yourself. You need to be able to go into yourself, assess what you have, take stock of, of where you are, and the ability to actually affect personal change. And Matt will be talking a little bit more about his journey. Uh, we're talking about organizational change. Um, so change your organization, which we'll be talking about as well. Um, and we're talking about code changes. Um, so one of one of the interesting things that uh, that a couple of people have been talking about, your code actually mirrors the organization. So if you're looking to actually change your code, take a look at your organization, and, you, and you'll see that structure reflected inside of your code. Um, so Conway's law states that your code base mirrors the communication channels within your organization. So if you have poor organizational uh, communication channels, or if you have distributed teams, you'll see that reflected inside your code inside your code base. Uh, so, understanding your code is the way to understand the organization, and vice versa. Um, Conway's law. So that that was Conway's law. There's another uh, there's another tweet that I saw recently that said um, your entire the, the political changes in your organization are reflected in your code. Um, so one of the one of my good friends. Uh, Leanne Gersing, also known as Ruby Buddha, um, he says your code is a reflection of who you are at that moment. So if we look at the code, we're looking at individuals who've contributed to that code base, making up an organization which kind of expands out into Conway's law. So you've got personal contributions, you're able to see people who are reflected in that code, and then expand that out into organization-wide uh, so, that, so that you can affect change. Um, and it's fascinating to actually look at some of the code bases. Uh, so change isn't change. Uh, we'll talk about that for a second. Uh, we have we have Little Richard's guitar player. Uh, he outgrew his organization. If you don't recognize him there, <laughs> you might recognize him here. Um, so Jimi Hendrix. Jimi Hendrix affected change. Changed the way people play guitar, changed the way rock and roll works, um, changed the entire landscape of, of music during, his, during that time period and, and going on. Um, Jimmy actually didn't come from a UFO, so he, he, he had a background uh, of blues and playing with Little Richard and playing some other gigs. He used that and reinterpreted it with his own personal attributes. Um, that's the kind of change we're looking for. Uh, another guy who very influential in changing the landscape of music uh, also seemed to come out of a UFO, didn't. Frank Zappa has a background in doo wop. Uh, he likes classical music, wrote many scores of music, uh, wrote orchestral scores, uh, wrote rock and roll tunes, directed videos, spoke to the Congress against PMRC. Uh, very influential character. Um, so take a look at this quote. I think it's interesting to take a look at who, who influences you in order to, to figure out where you're liable to change and what you're able to do. This one's pretty obvious. Um, if you're looking to change, if you're looking to change yourself or your organization, uh, it, it helps to be open. It helps to have an open organization um, one of the talks that I, that I heard recently from Angela Harms talks about change and what makes a successful organizational uh, environment in order to allow for you to be able to successfully change. Uh, a lot of that is open. 
So an open organization allows for change and allows for changes to happen. An organization where you're supported, you're supported in being able to change, being able to change the organization, being able to suggest things, being able to fail. Uh, these are all things important if you want to change your organization. So I love this word, uh, skeuomorphism. Uh, if you look at if you look at Steve Jobs, uh, big influencer in change. So he had an entire campaign for Apple, changed the way we deal with personal computers and personal devices to an extent. Um, so skeuomorphism, does anyone know what it means? Not so much. Um, it's, a it's a design philosophy. So yeah, Jobs changed the entire landscape, sort of. Uh, if you look at uh, Apple Contacts app, for instance. It's an example of skeuomorphism. What it means is that the real world is reflected in the computer designs. So he took, if you look at the Apple Contacts app, he took the, he took the leather from the seats in his private jet as a screenshot and had them reflect that in the Contacts app. Um, he was a big fan of skeuomorphism and it's kind of a controversial subject. Uh, people not reinventing things and not changing dramatically and drastically, where you're in a completely a different environment from the, on the computer than you are in the real world. Um, so did he change completely? No. Uh, if you look at the Mac operating system, Macs are based on Unix. Unix is what, 120 year old, give or take a year operating system. It's been around forever. Um, that's still the core, that's still the base. We're not completely redesigning things. Uh, when Mac was actually switching from OS 9, OS 9 to OS 10 or OS X, uh, there was a company out called B, uh, BOS. B was developed by an ex-Apple engineer, John Louis Gasset, a very crazy Frenchman. The system was designed completely from ground up. So it was developed in C++, C++ it was completely object oriented, as fast as anything, it was blazing fast. So you could actually drag real live videos around while you had sound, sound in the background, while you had you know, multiple things going on at the same time. You could render while you were dragging videos around. Revolutionary. Uh, nobody went that route. So that, that was too much change. If you look at Windows and the history of Windows, backwards compatibility. That's always critical and always important. Um, and B was developed in 97 or so. Um, so that was quite a long time ago, and it was blazing fast and actually used the hardware. Um, so for us to actually switch in that direction would have been a, a big improvement. Um, if you look at some other movements, so Rich Hickey has a language called Clojure. Clojure is making a lot of waves and impact in the industry. It's a big change. Uh, Clojure runs on the JVM, so it's it works really well but based on the kind of like the properties and the, and the speed and performance of the JVM. It's based on Lisp. Uh, let's get back to another 120 plus year old language. Um, basically, we're, re, we're reinventing the same things over and over and over again. So while there is change happening, closure is a big change. And it's a big difference in the way we're looking at things. Uh, we're still looking at the past. And we're still reinventing that past with our present eyes. Um, in order to in order to actually use Clojure, most popular editor, Emacs, uh, 120 year old editor. So we're looking at all these things, and the software industry itself is cyclical, like everything else. So while there is change, these cycles go round and round and come back, come back constantly. Um, if you look at you know fashion, for instance, bell bottoms were never supposed to come back. Um, they came back along with disco. Um, so we do go through these changes. In the software industry, generally the, the rate of change is about every 10 years. Uh, so if you're looking at kind of software methodologies, uh, software languages, that sort of thing, you're looking at kind of about a 10 year incubation point, a 10 year in incubation period in order to get to the next, the next movement, whatever's next. So factors against change. Change is hard. We've got fear of failure. I mean, it's the big one, F-U-D, right? Fear of failure. There's a real possibility of failure in change. Uh, so 
a lot of organizations are afraid of moving in a different direction. A lot of organizations are afraid of making those big changes, making those big leaps. Um, there are some examples of companies that did that and situations where that happened and didn't work out. Uh, take a look at New Coke. Uh, so they completely replaced the formula of Coke. That did not work out well. That did not so well. So they had to backpedal and essentially say, well, we're sorry. We made a mistake. We failed. Um, and it's important within an organization to be able to fail uh, if, if you want to implement change. Another one is the, just near and near, dear to me, um, I live in Denver. <coughs> so when they're building out the Denver airport, they set up a new baggage handling system. Um, if anyone's familiar with the success rate of the baggage handling system in Denver, um, it failed. It basically was a miserable billion dollar failure. Uh, so they had to roll back and take that away. Um, so failure is a real thing. Doubt uh, also also leads into kind of the same thing. Managers doubt that you can actually take things on. Um, a lot of this stems from organizational dysfunction. Um, so we've got fear, uncertainty, and doubt. One of the things I've dealt with over and over again is compliances and regulations, and used that being used as an excuse to bottleneck change. Um, so a lot of companies that I've worked with have gone through things like PCI compliance, um, SOX compliance. You get a lot of fear and doubt and uncertainty around SOX compliance. Nobody knows what it, nobody knows what it means, uh, but it's essentially used to bottleneck and stop things from happening, slow things down, and it's a, it's a gating factor for change in an organization. Um, and then we have management. So a lot of a lot of what we're talking about organizationally boils down to poor management. And it boils down to management that can't accept change in an organization. Um, I've been in, lucky in a couple of situations, and mostly lucky in my career, uh, but I've had support from the top. So when I was at The Gap, for instance, um, I was at The Gap for eight years, uh, both San Francisco, Columbus, and India, Moldavia, somewhere in South America. Um, I was able to make changes while I was at the Gap because I worked for the Vice President of Development. Um, I was the first person to actually open source code at the Gap uh, because he said, if you want to go ahead and open source that, that's fine. I've got your back. If legal comes out, I'll take him on. Um, that's a rare thing. Uh, right now, I'm working for Groupon. We're attempting to open source some more things. Uh, we've got a very elaborate, laborious process to go through that. Um, and we're dealing heavily with legal. Um, so management and management style can affect the rate of change within an organization. And in order to keep up in this area, we definitely need to be able to move quickly and be agile to some, to some degree. Um, one of the recent news stories that came out was about the Yahoo CEO. She had a very controversial statement saying, we're no longer allowing workers to work remotely. Uh, pretty big bomb. Whether that's a good management sign or a bad management sign, um, she is not moving. She is not moving Yahoo forward. Um, Yahoo was what it was at the time in '97, early mid to mid to late '90s. Um, does anyone use Yahoo currently as their main search engine? or an email address aside from just kind of a secondary email address to send spam to. Yahoo is not what they used to be, uh, although they did buy Tumblr for a billion dollars. Um, so I'll say this, um, Agile is dying, probably dead. Agile as, Agile as a software development lifecycle, Agile with a big A, um, as opposed to Agile with a little a, is dead. Um, these things come in waves, as I said. The software industry goes into about 10 year cycles. Um, so tomorrow was off, I think. So <laughs> we're going to call it quits. Um, Agile to me uh, has become a commoditized uh, process, and it's something that people can sell. And it's something that people think they have the right idea about. Um, I've talked to when I first started doing Agile uh, 10 years ago, something like that. 
Um, I was an early adopter. The company was an early adopter. Um, so you do get the early adopter curve where you start out, um, you've got kind of the, the Dunning-Kruger effect where you, you really don't know that much about it, and, but you've got some general idea of what's happening, a vague generalization. Um, you end up reading a lot of books and assuming you know from the books what's going on. Um, we brought in consultants, so we dealt with ThoughtWorks for years and years. Um, ThoughtWorks is a big agile consultancy and they've built their basis, they built their reputation on, on doing a lot of agile change and turnover. Um, so we did go through that. But Agile's dead. What does that mean? And what do we do? Um, so as I said, Agile with a capital A is has become kind of a codified process. Um, you can look it up on the web. There's multiple sites saying you need to do these 15 steps in order to be Agile. Um, and I thought that once upon a time. I used to talk to people and say, well, are you, are you guys doing Agile processes or what are you doing? I was like, sure we are. And I walked through and asked them, okay, are you doing this? Well, no. Are you doing stand-ups? Well, no. <laughs> are you doing code reviews? Mm, no. Are you doing paired coding? No. What are you doing that's Agile? <laughs> so it, it, became kind of a, it became kind of a useless way of talking about a process and the process we're using. Uh, Agile, to me, was the explosion. So Agile was, Agile was developed about, let's say 13 years ago, something like that, 2000, 2000, uh, about 10 guys or so ended up going up to Snow Park, sitting together, and kind of boiling down the essence of what we want to do as, a, as software developers and to be successful and have successful processes. Um, to me, that's Agile. That's what it's all about. It's about breaking apart the previous processes that we did have. So before that, everything was waterfall. We had, had a um, waterfall kind of happened by happenstance. It just happened to be waterfall. Um, everyone kind of got in that groove. And then Agile came along and said, no, 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 we're not going to do that. These are the core features that we need. These are the core values that we have. Um, so it's an explosion. It's like a Lego building, right? So we had a big Lego building, and it was built and built and built upon. It didn't work for us. So these guys came along and exploded that out. Agile, to me, what that means now is taking those pieces, taking the explosion, taking the shards, figuring out what makes sense for your organization, what makes sense for you, what makes sense at the time, what makes sense for your project, and using those pieces and putting them together in something new. Um, it's also not revolutionary. So these are processes that we've been doing for a long time. Paired coding I've been doing since I started out. Um, randomly pairing with people here and there. Um, a lot of these processes are, are not new processes. It's a matter of reinterpreting and understanding what we have, reinterpreting those, and using the pieces that actually make sense. That's how you effectively get through change. Uh, so that's what I mean by agile is dead. <clears throat> So a lot of this is understanding what you have. Um, so I talked about code bases. There are multiple ways to kind of go through a code base and understand what you have. If you don't know what you have, if you haven't taken a personal inventory, you're not able to change yourself successfully. If you don't know where you are, how do you know where you're gonna, where you're gonna go? This is the same thing we do as an organization. If you don't understand your code base, if you don't know what's happening, um, the amount of information that we have is amazing right now. Uh, so a lot of the work I've been doing at Groupon is taking a look at our code bases and taking a look at what we have. So we use Git as our kind of main, uh, main source code control tool. It's an interesting tool. Um, I personally don't think it's actually applicable for kind of everyday workflow use because I think it's too low level. I think it's low level to the point where you can get all sorts of information on different things but it's a library uh, that should be built upon. So we're actually using Git. We're pulling information like churn rate. Uh, if I look at this file, who's touched it? How many people have touched it? Where is it going? What are the connections between the people that have touched it? So we're, we're gathering affinity between people and building out essentially a social network for code. Um, so if I look at this person, I can say, who are you connected to? 
what does that tell us? If we time box that, that potentially tells us you know, who, who is on which project team. So for understanding the code for somebody new coming in, that's great. As opposed to digging around, we have a group on, uh, I believe about 300 developers in the US. Um, we have a gigantic monolithic uh, code base for our main application. So the main web application that you see, it's huge. Trying to dive into that and trying to figure out what's going on is near impossible. So understanding what you have, gathering that information is critical. We're not taking advantage of the information we have. So the information that is available in Git is amazing. The, the amount of connections that you can actually get out of that, pulling that out, gathering metrics is impressive. We're also tying that into Pivotal Tracker. So if you're using a tracking utility, if you're using a bug tool, these things can all be tied together. We're gathering as much information about these tools as we possibly can because it tells us more information about our organization and it tells us more information about our asset. And our assets, the organization plus the code and our customers. Um, so yeah, stay on top of your code base. Um, one of the things I dealt with at the Gap, uh, we're actually dealing with a group on as well. We've got old code. We've got a whole bunch of legacy code. We've got a whole bunch of old code that we're not using. We have dead code. Um, and then we're also using some very old libraries. So if you're not keeping up, if you're not actively working to improve things, there will be change. It's just change in the wrong direction. So theory of chaos, everything basically blows out to, chaotic, to a chaotic state if you don't end up taking care of it. So looking at the looking at Groupon right now, we're running a Rails 2.3.8 app. Rails 4 is out. Rails 2.3 is basically end of life. We're using Ruby 1.8.7. We've had a project now for the past year trying to look at upgrading to Ruby 1.9. Ruby 1.8.7 is end of life next year. So we haven't actively taken care of updating our dependencies. But the Gap, the Gap is a great example. We switched from ASP, we switched from about 20 developers using ASP, IIS, that whole thing, onto a complete new project. So you want to talk massive change and massive scale? We ended up moving within within about three months. We went from that to 200 plus developers, consultants, everything else, switching over to J2E app, which took us two years, well over $60 million. So it was a lot of change, a lot of change happening on that. And that was more change than the organization could actually cope with. Um, so one of the things we were left with after that happened uh, was burnout. So we did lose employees. Um, and, and at the same time, we actually ended up end of life as well. So the gap actually pushed COBOL to the point where we ended up using object-oriented COBOL at one point, um, pushed it to the point where it was end of life by the organization that actually sold the, the COBOL packages and everything else that we were using. The end of life, it, so we didn't take care of things, and we didn't, we didn't actually track what we had so that we could actually change, be agile, which essentially means moving into the future, and the ability to move. Um, agile I like as a verb. I think it's a great verb. I think it's a terrible noun. Um, and that's what it's essentially become. Um, but the gap, is, uh, the gap also took Java 1, 4, 2 to end of life. Um, web scare to get to end of life. These are things that we didn't track. We didn't know we, that, that we had these dependencies and we didn't stay on top of it. So it's critical if you're going to change, if you're going to be successful, if you're going to move. It's a fast moving industry. If you're going to move into the future, you have to know what you have and you have to stay on top of it. Uh, bottom up measurements. So I talked a bit about metrics uh, as an ability to drive change or at least know what you have. Um, it's critical that we gather this information. The amount of information, as I said, that we have is amazing and impressive. Um, the danger of metrics, and the reason most people hate the term metrics, is because it comes from the top down. Um, so it's essentially not as a, it's not used as an agent of change. 
It's used as kind of a CYA, I see what you're doing, point the finger, top-down approach. Um, whereas bottom-up, if we're looking at the code base, who's going to who's going to get more from looking at the code base, the developers or the management, who doesn't actually look at the code base? Um, developers can actually use that, talk to management, and affect change. Um, so, but I think it's critical that that comes from the bottom up. Uh, accept change. So this is a challenging one for organizations, um, and there is a possibility of potential failure. So there are projects, I've heard about projects going on for years and years, a uh, five-year-long project at Siemens, I think, um, that eventually just got canned. Um, so people working on a five-year-long project because it failed. Um, failure is a reality. Simply is a reality. And it will happen. Uh, but your organization has to be able to absorb and understand that if they are changing, they need to accept the fact that there's a potential for failure. Um, and understand that you don't know everything. Uh, this is kind of a personal. This is kind of a personal change point. Um, as developers, there's a there's a book called um, Seven Languages in Seven Weeks, um, which I think is a great book. So it goes through it goes through seven different languages. Kind of walks you, steps you through each one, and it's a great book to learn. Um, but you have to do one thing, and this happens over and over again. You have to have the ability to. As Dave Weber puts it in his book, uh, Apprenticeship Patterns, you have to be able to take the white belt. What does take the white belt mean? It means essentially accepting the fact that you don't know everything and that you're going to make a lot of mistakes as you, as you change. So if you learn a new language, if you go through this whole thing, if you're interested in change and improving yourself, you're going to have to take the white belt. You're going to have to be the beginner again. And it's challenging as, as you move on. Um, I'm a, I was a software architect, um, and I know a lot of software architects. The challenge in being a software architect is you're supposed to know everything. So rolling back, accepting the fact that you're a beginner in this particular area is critical in order to change, in order to learn. And I think there's a, there's a lot of people I've seen in the software field that don't have that ability, and so they're not able to actually move, learn, grow and change. So change your organization. Um, most of you are probably familiar with the expression change your organization or change your organization. Uh, so that was Martin Fowler, I believe, who said that. It's a really facile thing to say. It sounds pretty trivial, right? Change your organization or change your organization. You're talking about two of the hardest things to do in our industry. Um, one is change your organization. So affect change across your organization. Make it work. Not very easy, unless your organization is accepting, accepting uh, of changes. Change your organization. The second part means leave. Get out. Time to go. Also not very easy to do. Um, I know a lot of people who are basically stuck in their situation, or feel like they're stuck in their situation. So I've worked at companies where I'm dealing with people who've worked in the same job for 30, 40 years. Um, there's a company locally that I worked at. Uh, shocked me. When I, when I showed up for the very first day, I walked down the, walked down the hallway, walked down the cube way. Um, it was quiet as, a, quiet as a church. Didn't think anyone was there. But I walked by every cube, looked in, there was somebody there. And then outside the cube wall, there was a paper saying, congratulations for your 30 years of service. Congratulations for your 40 years of service. Congratulations for your 20 years of service. So people are afraid to leave. Um, they've been there for a long time. They know what they're doing. They're afraid to leave. Uh, this job market right now is hot. Um, and yet I talk to people all the time who are afraid to leave where they are. Um, and there's multiple reasons why that, why that happens. Um, so understanding motivations is critical to changing an organization. If you're going to stay in the organization where you are, so at the Gap, I was lucky enough to actually be able to affect change for eight years. It was exhausting. It was tiring. It was completely, by the, by the time I left, um, I was lucky. They actually, had, so I, I started out in San Francisco and then moved to Denver. They said, well, keep working for us. 
So great. So I worked remote. After eight years, they finally asked me to move back to San Francisco. I said no. Best thing that ever happened to me. Um, I would have stayed there another couple of years easily, without a doubt. Um, when I left, I realized I was burned out. So I ended up going on to um, I ended up going on to Facebook after that, uh, which everyone thought was the greatest opportunity in the world. I said, "Wow, you're working for Facebook, the biggest company on the internet." You have how many users? 900 million users. Holy crap. Um, it was terrible. So one, one of the things I finally realized was this is not for me. Um, and we'll get to that in the next slide. But this is a, so changing your organization is not an easy thing to do. Um, I did fight. It was basically, I compared to swimming with a rope, trying to drag the Titanic away from the iceberg. Um, a little hard for one person to do. And it does lead to burnout. Uh, so one, is, uh, one of the things, one of the factors that uh, enables you to change an organization is if you're able to lead by example. So trying to get unit tests into, I've done this as a consultant, I've done this as a, working at different companies. Trying to get unit tests, for example, into a company, trying to get developers to use unit testing, uh, a lot of them are very resistant to doing that. Push when you can step back when you're done and just do it. So I've been able to go into a group, work with a group of people who are interested in actually doing unit testing. Um, there's a fantastic short film by Francis Coppola, uh, Zoe's Garden, I think it was. Um, Zoe was very sad because she didn't have any friends. So she actively went out looking for friends and was, was kind of miserable. Couldn't find anyone who wanted to play with her. What she ended up doing was having so much fun in her backyard by herself, using her imagination, creating things, that people were attracted to that. So she was, so she led people in and drew people in without even realizing that. Um, so with unit testing, working with a group of people who actually love to do unit testing or want to learn about it, comes a time when people say, "What are you doing that's working so well?" I don't get it. Why is my stuff not working great? I'm here till 8 o'clock at night, and you're out at 5. Um, so lead by example. Show people. Be the, be the change agent you want to see happen. Um, Matt and I were talking about recognize the archetypes. So this is kind of an interesting one. Um, if you're dealing with, in every organization, there are archetypes. There might be the den mother. Um, you know, there might be the, the, the loud, brash architect. Um, that there are various archetypes. And within a successful organization, those archetypes work together successfully. Um, if you're working for a small company or a small team, um, you'll notice that when one of those archetypes leaves, things become a little bit more chaotic and hectic. Um, so it's a matter of, kind of recognizing what you have, which, it, which enables you also to understand people's motivations and, and how things work and how the team is organized. Um, then we have find support groups. Uh, so Matt actually runs a company, or a company. Uh, you'd love to run a company, right? Um, no. Matt, <laughs> Matt runs a group called CRB, um, <coughs> which is a user group. When you're pushing for change and when you're pushing for all these things to happen within your organization, you will get burned out easily. You will get very burned out unless you find a support group, find a user group, find find some people who actually actively are doing what you're doing or who have been through it. If you don't have that, you'll be, an on, you'll be on an island. And that's a very, very lonely place to be. Um, so there are ways to change your organization. Some organizations are better at changing than others. Um, I personally like going in uh, on occasion and doing rescue projects. <laughs> So when I was a consultant, it was an interesting gig. Uh, I was able to go into dysfunctional companies and say, you, you guys are dysfunctional. Let's fix this. We actually have to get, we have to get you guys talking together, working together, everything else. Um, but, it, but it's definitely a big challenge. But it comes down to 
at some point you may have to give up. So you may have to change your organization. Uh, if you look at the reasons why people leave their jobs, um, this is a great quote, I love this, I don't know who said it, but I've heard it a bunch of times, you don't leave your job, you leave your manager. Um, most of it boils down to management problems. Most of it boils down to the fact that you can't get things done, that you're not doing your job. Uh, you know, there's a term called yak shaving. And yak shaving applies to like organizations and everything else. Um, yak shaving essentially means there's all sorts of stuff you need to get done in order for, to, for you to do your job. Um, and it takes a lot of time and it's tiring and it's exhausting and it happens over and over again in different companies. Um, I was working in a job once where I had uh, three meetings at each time slot. All day long, all week long, three meetings at each time slot. I had to figure out who I was gonna piss off out of those three people. So one week I would go to one meeting, piss off one of the other people and say, why weren't you at my meeting? Next week I'd go to their meeting, piss off the first person, then the third person be pissed off. And it was kind of a constant shell game. Um, these are the things that cause people to leave. Salary is not at the top of the list. Um, you know, free soda is not at the top of the list. There are people who like free soda and may leave for it, I don't know, but uh, free soda is well down on the list as well as you know, some of the other perks. People will work in an organization because they like the people, they like the management, they feel like they're doing an important job. One of my mantras, it's kind of a trivial way to say it, but uh, what I want to do in my, in my work is have fun doing cool stuff with cool people. Simple as that. If I'm doing that, everything else is, is a perk. Salary is a perk. Um, you know, I, I don't want to be living on subsistence wages, but it's not at the top of the list for me. Um, and it's not at the top of the list for people that you want to work with. Or shouldn't be. And now on to Mr. Darby. Um, so, I, as I mentioned, I saw a blog post from Matt uh, about a week ago or so. Um, so a lot, of what, a lot of what we're talking about is changing your organization and the ability to actually move forward, uh, which is pretty critical. But in order to do that, you need to look at yourself. And so you need to be able to change yourself and you need to be able to assess yourself and understand what you have. Um, I don't know if you want to take a metaphor, uh, you know, look at your own internal code base. What do you have? What are you made up of? How are you going to refactor yourself? Uh, it's actually a book called uh, Refactoring Your Wetware. It's uh, put out by Prag Prog, the um, Pragmatic Press, uh, written by Andy Hunt. Pretty fascinating book. Looks at your brain, how you work, so that in order to, so in order to change yourself, you need to understand how you work and how you can trick your brain and how you can actually change yourself and refactor your, refactor your wetware, as they say. Um, and without further ado, we'll attempt to switch microphones and. Matt will talk about his experience for <laughs> change. So I, I have an interesting story, um, or at least I like to think it's interesting. And uh, I wrote a blog post, as mentioned, um, just last week, and I got a lot of really kind of amazing feedback about it. And a lot of the times when I talk to people, um, it's not the technical stuff that interests people, because you can read a blog post, you can read a book. Um, it's really people's personal paths that I, I find inspiring. And a lot of people, you know, tend to. So um, I want to introduce you to Matt Darby in 1997. Right? He's ultra cool. He's got an eyebrow ring. He's in the fun recreational activities. Um, so I, I checked out for three years in high school. I did nothing. I didn't go. I didn't do anything. Um, when I did show up, it was basically to sign suspension papers, um, and go about my day. I got so good at forging my mother's name that one time she actually signed a suspension slip and uh, the principal looked at it and goes, this isn't her signature. I'm like, call her. You know, it worked out really well. So I say that I failed three or four grades because I actually don't know. The school didn't actually know. Uh, at one point I was actually listed in, I think, two or three separate grades because they just didn't know. Um, so at the end of these three years, right, I mean, I'm, I'm basically a loser. Um, I was totally a loser. Um, and I kind of realized that, like, at age 17, being a burnout's fun because you don't have responsibilities. But then it's like, one day you're going to wake up and you're going to be 40 or 50 or 30, whatever. And what you do then at 17 kind of, you know, predicts what you're going to be at 30. 
So, um, but during this time, I had signed my dropout papers. Uh, my mom signed it. The, you know, I, basically all I had to do was go hand it in, and I was free to go. And I kind of realized that, like, you know, not being in school when you're supposed to be is fun, but when you have nothing else to do, you're just a loser. Um, yeah, I, I had a 0, 0.0, which I, you know, think is really great. I want to put that on a resume. So I, I literally did nothing. <laughs> so I was working at this metal shop in Cleveland, and this is the story of Tito. Tito was a wonderful little Venezuelan man who um, I worked with, um, really nice guy. Um, and the metal shop we worked at, we did a process called roll forming. And basically what that means is that there is a large coil of steel that goes up through this uh, punch press. There's a little die in there with like three inch thick steel and like teeth going through cutting holes in it. And it goes up through these rolls and it forms it into like channels or you know whatever, make like elevator track, that kind of thing. Well, Tito had been running the same machine, the same job for 14 years. And I actually figured it out, it's 28,000 hours. This man was standing there doing the same thing 5,000 times a day for 14 years. Well, one day I was um, being his assistant. And, uh, you know, he, again, he's done this job a million times. And he kind of slipped. So this, the punch press, the red thing, it was out uh, getting all the teeth sharpened because it wears down after a while. So the tow motor comes over and it's putting the die into this 80 ton press. So 80 tons of pressure. Tito is standing there and he pushes the die in and like the three inch thick plate is underneath his thumbs or you know, his thumbs are over it. And his elbow hits a kill switch, right? The machine wasn't off. So uh, Tito lost his thumbs, like both of his thumbs. And uh, I happened to be standing there and it was uh, pretty much this. So Tito got complacent, <laughs> and uh, this is what it led to. Um, he was actually, you know, obviously upset about losing his thumbs, but uh, he was happy because he got five thousand dollars in workman's comp per thumb. Um, you know, I, I, and he's still there. I always wondered, like, how the hell do you open up a doorknob, right? I mean, it's like thumbs are good. Um, also, note my awesome Dr. Seuss hands. <laughs> so, so I'm, I'm in the, the midst of this, right? And it's like, and you know, and I have like kind of this score behind me. I have a 0, 0.0. It's like, this is my trajectory. This is where I'm going to be. I'm working second shift at this horrible place. And I'm surrounded by people that started there when they were 17 too, 18. And, um, you know, I'm going to leave. I'll be here for two years. And four years later, they're there. So I started to correct my trajectory. And I realized like, you know, I'm not gonna be one of these people, right? I like my hands. And every time I think about that metal shop, like my hands curl up. Um, so I went to the uh, foreman and I asked for a quarter cent, or not a quarter cent, a quarter an hour raise, right? Big, big gigantic bump. And he literally said this to me. And that was all he said to me. He was just like, you know, like get out of here. So I mean, those are pretty potent words, you know? It kind of made me realize the errors of my ways immediately. So I changed my trajectory. So I was in high school, you know, 17, ninth grade. Then I got into a vocational school and I started learning uh, electrical engineering. And I, it really taught me immediately that learning is amazing. And it can be fun. It's just not boring, dry, 40 year old textbook kind of stuff. And then I would go to the metal shop at night, work full eight hours. I'd come back home and I'd study and then I'd sleep for four hours. So for the next two years, it's 20 hour days. That's insane. I mean, you just, you get so burned out. And at the end of those two years, when I finally graduated, it was just, you know, ecstatic. I could sleep in. So I, I went to school. I, I, I got in at DeVry here in town and I've been here since, um, you know, and I, I changed my position. So this is 2013 Darby, right? I now have two degrees. I'm a professor at Franklin, senior developer, and you know, fatter, balder, right? So I, I've tried working on both and it doesn't really work. But over those 17 years, you know, I accomplished this. I think the big thing is that I own the machine. Instead of working on that mill and being paid to operate and push buttons, I own it. I can go wherever I want with it. It's outstanding. And you can really choose your position. 
And, uh, you know, at Neo, we had beer and hammock. Uh, hammocks. We had multiple hammocks, let me tell you. And, you know, hammocks are pretty awesome. So, so the big thing is that people are, are afraid, right? I mean, it's a completely natural response. Anytime when I leave the CRB and I ask people to speak, I hear these reasons every single time. People don't think that they're good enough. They think that you have to be like some absolute expert in everything. The real truth is, is that everybody's winging it all the time. Everybody. Everything's being made up. Once you kind of understand that and let go of yourself, uh, life opens up. It's, it, it's tremendous. I have to put a Vonnegut quote in here. I like to think that sometimes you don't always have to follow the direct path to your end goals. You can kind of take the scenic route like I did. I don't regret any of it. I, I grew, I learned so much more. You know, doing the 20 hour days over two years was not fun, but it made me grow and realize what education and, you know, doing your own thing is really worth. So there's tons of opportunity out there. And I think people kind of, like if, if you're in a cubicle, let's just say, I mean, that's your world. And you tend to just become institutionalized and you just sit there and you always think about shuffling your papers and people don't realize that there's tons of doors out there. I mean, you can, you can do whatever you want. Like, I mean, Charlie contacted me, I'm like, what, yesterday? <laughs> you know? And, you know, he's like, hey, let's present. I'm like, okay, cool. And we came up with this last night. It's an opportunity. You got to jump on it. When I became a, a professor at Franklin, um, I got a phone call on a Wednesday. I happened to be friends with the um, uh, chair of the computer science department at Franklin. He calls me up on a Wednesday, and he's like, hey, um, I see that you're giving classes around town on Ruby. I'm like, yeah. And um, he's like, well, how would you like to teach for me? Yeah, totally. Like, when, when do I start? He's like, how's Monday? So Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Monday. So I, I just jumped, and now I get to say I'm a professor. It's, it's all about saying yes to some opportunities. It's, you know, there's tons out there. So whenever I speak to younger folks especially, um, they're always dealing with this fear. They haven't let themselves go yet. So I always tell them to never negotiate with yourself. You get a job offer, it's $50,000. Well, I really want 60, but you're negotiating with yourself. You don't get what you don't ask for. It's, it's just tried and true. And if you're not out there giving yourself, you're not up here speaking, you're not out there writing, you're not out there changing yourself, you're never gonna grow. And that's sad, man, because you only have so much time. I mean. It, you can do anything you want, and it sounds so damn trite, but it, it's, it's absolutely true. Sharing. Um, people like to hold their cards close to their body because they, like, they fear that they don't know everything. They know that they don't know everything, and they assume that everyone else does. I know this, so everyone must know this. And that's completely not true. Go out there, give to, your, give to people, give to your community. It's, it, you will get everything back tenfold. I mean, leading the CRB, I've made so many friends, so many opportunities, and it's free. You know, you just go, you have a great time, and you learn about stuff. There's job opportunities. I said, you know, we became friends. People have babies. It's wonderful. So more preaching. This one always gets thrown around. You really have to do what you love. Um, at the uh, conference called Kalamazoo X, uh, just a few months ago in, in Kalamazoo, um, it was a wonderful conference. I, you should all make it next year. Sincerely, it's 25 bucks. It's completely worth it. Um, there's a great speaker there named Elizabeth Naramore. She works uh, at GitHub out of uh, Cincinnati. And she was talking about how she woke up one day with, with a five-bedroom house, you know, husband, a good husband, made good living, all that kind of stuff, you know, two happy children. And she realized she just wasn't happy. She, she just wasn't. She had everything. And everyone told her that she should be happy. So not to get into her personal story, but she left. She left her job, she left her husband, she moved out. And that was three years ago, and now she's happier than everything, than anything before. So sometimes it's really difficult, but you have to know when is when. The big thing about working with great teams is surrounding yourself with people that are great. You can read blog posts when, you know, I can Google anything that I need and I can find an answer, but it's when you're working with people, you get that serendipitous knowledge. You're like, oh, that's how you do that. Oh, cool. I didn't even know I needed that. 
and that can change your entire day, change your entire workflow. So you really have to be around great people. It's, it's an amazing way to grow. I said your time is precious. It's, it's slipping by. You know, uh, like I said, I woke up after three years and realized that I had wasted three years. Um, so it, there's no time like the present. Another thing that gets thrown around a lot is about permissions. Um, and it kind of feeds back into the fear. You know, like my manager won't let me do this. Bullshit, do it. Are they gonna fire you? I mean, maybe you should be fired. Maybe you should find a different place. Sometimes it's as simple as that. I've been embedded in companies and after you know, four hours with them, we'll go out to lunch and they're like, well, what can we do? I was like, mutiny. And they just kind of laugh. It's like, no, seriously. It's like, you guys are the developers. If management isn't listening to you, you guys are the brains. I'm not saying you start stuff on fire. I'm saying this is the way we have to do it. They're not going to fire everybody. And if they do, cool. Um, well, seriously, right? I mean, and, and that place I'm talking about with the mutiny, there was eight developers. And within four months, every single one of them quit. All of them. And the company's back to square one. That doesn't benefit anybody. You got to be able to stand up and speak your mind. You're there for a reason. Another big thing is paying things forward. Um, a lot of times in the news, you know, you always hear about the bad people, right? Because that's, that's what grabs the headlines. I think people get kind of hunkered down and burned out on that. You always have to remind yourself that people intrinsically are great. Everyone out here is just a wonderful person. And no matter who you are, people are always listening to you. It's like it's the, the pebble in the pond with the ripple, right? I mean, imagine if Hendrix didn't leave. He, I mean, he's with little Richard, right? He's one of the biggest acts of the era. Why would you leave? It's a good, steady income. Well, you had to answer a different call. And I mean, imagine, you know, imagine rock and roll or imagine life without Jimi Hendrix. I mean, that's not a world I want to live in. So get out, speak your mind, let people know who you are. And I mean, say stuff that's controversial. It's fun. <laughs> so, yeah, that's really the talk. <laughs> The thunderous applause, right? We were looking for avatars yesterday, last night, and we, uh, I looked up Charlie and I happened to notice this gravestone. We're like, yeah, this is a great idea. So, yeah. <laughs> That's really it, man. Any questions, thoughts, concerns, anger? Okay. People need coffee. Coffee time? Yeah. What's that? thing that made you leave Gap? Oh, there are many things that could have made me leave the Gap. Um, the one thing is they asked me to move back to San Francisco and I said no. Um, I, I, I told them flat out, if it was another company, if it was another opportunity, I might move back to San Francisco, but not for you guys. I'm done. <laughs> um, I got more sleep after that. I, I mean, literally, I was burned out. Um, so I was pushing and changing the organization for eight years, for eight solid years, pushing and changing an enterprise organization is not an easy thing to do. Um, I got, so like I said, I got the first open source library, still the only one out there, um, even though it's been a few years. Um, I got them to actually use Ruby internally, uh, so Ruby was a big change. Um, I changed the, the way QA actually tested. Um, so kind of a lot of changes, but after a while it was exhausting. Um, I'm doing a similar thing right now at, uh, at Groupon, uh, but there is a little bit more flexibility. Uh, but to be honest with you, I would have stayed there for another couple of years. And that's, you know, that's on me. Um, it was great and I look back on it and I'm amazed at how much I got accomplished, um, but it was, it was beyond challenging. Um, you know, like everything from insomnia to, you know, you name it. I was tired. And then when I hit Facebook, um, so it, it was kind of a powerful thing. So one, one of the things I mentioned was, you know, when do you change your organization? When do you leave? Um, one of the things boils down to like, hey, I just don't like this anymore. It's just not fun. This is not a good place for me. It's not a good fit. Um, so I did go to Facebook and, I, and I, you know, people said, hooray, huzzah. Um, after I worked there for about six months and realized, hey, this is not for me. Um, you know, a bunch of kids scootering around the hallways. Um, I did that. Um, you know, them having working hours, like all hours of the night and day, I did that. 
Um, I'm actually now almost refused to work beyond 40 hours a week um, and have since leaving the gap. Um, but I had, but I left, and I got constantly questioned, "Why did you leave Facebook? Like it's a great opportunity. It's it's they're you know a game changer. They're one of the people out there doing amazing things." And I said, "You know what? I realized it wasn't for me. You know, leaving the gap and and splitting out of that gave me the strength to actually realize I don't have to stay somewhere. I don't have to stick around. And like I said, the industry is buzzing. Um, if you go to things like CRB." If you meet up with people, if you start CRB, or if you start talking, um, get out on the speaker circuit, start talking. Everyone does have something to say. Uh, it's, you know, it is pretty amazing when you talk to people. They say, I don't have anything to say. Well, it's pretty easy to tease out something. You can talk to them a little bit, ask some questions, tease something out, and you say, you have a lot to say. Um, so getting out to these events, um, I could leave my current job and have four job offers in an, an, an hour. Um, so being able to change your job, that gives you power to say, this isn't for me anymore. I want to go somewhere else and do something else. And I see a lot of people, like I said, there's a lot of people stuck in cubicles, never hear from them. They do the eight to five thing. They're stuck in cubicles. They don't talk to anyone. They don't get out to, they don't come out to conferences like this. Um, and it's, you know, that leads you to stagnation. And if you stagnate, you're not going to be able to make the change to switch careers and, and to go into something else. So you'll be writing, you know, you'll be writing Java in 40 years where Java becomes COBOL and, and people are basically doing Java um, the same way that people are doing COBOL now. It's still stuck in that um, and not moving beyond learning, learning other languages and, and seeing what's out there. Um, and like I said, the, the industry itself um, is kind of on a 10 year trajectory as I see it. Um, so you get early adopters, and then 10 years later, you get kind of a widespread adoption of processes, languages, that sort of thing. Um, so if I look at Ruby now, I've been using Ruby for um, seven years. Uh, about seven years. Seven, maybe eight years. Um, so it's been out for a long time. It's a great language. I love it. Um, but it's also kind of time to look at moving on to the next new thing. Um, I'm an early adopter. I like new technology. I like moving on to different things. Um, so while I I'll I'll may never leave it entirely, or at least for a while, um, I'm looking at new opportunities, uh, and I'm looking at new things. So it has been that, that, you know, actually Ruby's been out for 15 years, something like that. Since like 90, yeah, sort 20. of 95-ish. Well, Ruby 2 was released on its 20th birthday. Yeah, I mean, it, yeah, it is 20, but I don't know, there are a couple yeah. of years there where it, didn't really matter. Um, <laughs> it, wasn't, it wasn't. It wasn't a big splash. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's time to move on. And, and then looking at agile. So most companies are adopting agile. Um, with a capital A. Um, there's still a lot of money to be made in it. So people are making a ton of money by consulting in agile. And I'm sure there's some of you out there who are doing who are scrum masters and everything else. Um, it's time to move on. It's time to realize you know these are the lessons that we learned from this. Um, let's take that and apply it and, and be agile, be more flexible. Um, so yeah, I don't know where I don't know where I was headed with that, but <laughs> good luck. <laughs> take that and run with it. <laughs> Any other questions or personal experiences? Yeah. Any suggestions on how for those people that are kind of stagnant or stuck in an organization, how to get them, you know, from an org if the organization would like to see them them I would say you can't do it. Um, it's all about personal motivation. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It, it, there are there are organizational problems that lead to stagnation of people and individuals. Uh, so if you remove some of those stumbling blocks, so I I've, I've been a consultant as well, and going into different organizations. Um, one of the things you'll see is, especially with large organizations, enterprise level organizations, one of the things you'll see is, um, this kind of sums it up. If you've ever worked at a place where you've watched somebody new come in and you hear the comment, um, wow, they're really enthusiastic, wait until we beat that out of them. <laughs> that, is kind of the, that is kind of the mentality of a, of a company that's, that drives you down. Um, so if you're able to remove some of the stumbling blocks, if you're able to like, help them do your job, Ideally, management is help 
I want to help you do your job and I'll stand out of the way. Let me know what you need to do it and I'll stand out of the way. So as a consultant, I would go into some companies, meet up with, uh, I don't know, a couple dozen people. Out of that couple dozen people in a company, uh, I might find you know, two or three who were kind of lost souls who had that spark and who wanted to get out but just didn't know how to get out. Uh, but the majority of them, you can't, uh, you can't change people's minds. So I find that I find that to be a losing battle. Um, if you can change the organization to make it more successful, or to at least so that people have the ability to be successful at their job, that's great. Um, but it's but it's not going to work for everyone. And as you change those organizations, some people will leave because they're terrified of it. I run into a lot of people at CRB. Uh, actually, just this past one, a uh, gentleman came up to me and he's like, you know, I want to learn Ruby. I'm like, okay, cool. Here's some books. You know, here, here's some pointers. And he goes, well, you know, what I really want to do is increase my, like, income. I'm like, okay. And he, you know, he said, he goes, I don't really care if it's Ruby or not. I'm like, okay. And I'm like, well, how can I help you? And he goes, well, it boils down to the fact that, like, I, I want more money, but I don't have the time. I don't have the time to learn it. And it's just like, like, you know, like, I have a USB cable. I can just plug it in and download it, and you just go and charge money, right? So it, the, the recurring thing that I hear is that people don't have time. And uh, it's complete BS. Um, there's infinite amount of time during the day if you're motivated and you want to do it and you make it a priority. Um, you know, I, I work full time at Neo. I run a consultancy. I do the CRB. I'm a professor, and I have a toddler at home. Turn off the television. <laughs> you know, I mean, you can program from the couch. You can still be relaxed. You can still be comfortable. Just use your time more wisely. And after you work towards your goal for a while, you know, whatever a length amount of time, you know, you'll earn it. And then you can watch TV. Yeah, I mean, one of the um, one of the things I just mentioned was I I don't do over forty hour weeks. Um, I just refuse to, for the most part, and it actually works out really well. Uh, a lot of people don't refuse to and say, oh, I'll keep working. They want to get ahead. They want to do other things, and yet they end up working like sixty hours for for the man. Um, so they're not able to actually learn other things. They're not able to do other things. They're not able to grow. Um, so Uncle Bob had a great post a couple of years ago about exactly this. So put in your 40 hours and then put in another 20 hours outside of work improving yourself. Um, Dave Hoover said the same thing. Uh, so if you want to move forward, if you want to learn things, spend some time outside of work and don't spend all your time inside of work. Um, opportunities are huge and wide and vast outside of work. Um, they may be vast inside your work, I'm not sure. If they are, great. Um, but most of the time you're working on uh, specific projects and company Know, company specific projects and you're not learning things outside of that. Um, one of the things we do at, one of the things we did at uh, Facebook and one of the things we do at Groupon is do a hackathon. Uh, so at Groupon we just had one last week. So I went up to Chicago, we did a hackathon which is basically come up with a project, come up with an idea, grab a team of people, whoever wants to be on it, you know, whoever's, who's ever the right people, join up spend the entire week working on that project. Um, so we had things like lending libraries where you know if people wanted to trade people wanted to trade books because they had a technical book or whatever book they could like sign up and trade back and forth. Um, you know we had, a, we had dozens of projects that were com some of which were more related to the business and some of which weren't. Um, we also worked in different languages. We also worked in Rails 4. Uh, so like I said our main app is on Rails 2.3.8 uh, these guys took it, took it on themselves to work in Rails 4 because they wanted to learn it. Um, we had some guys who wanted to learn Closure, so that, you know, that Lisp-based 120-year-old language. Um, they wanted to learn Closure, so they ended up rebuilding a, a, a system in Closure just in order to learn it um, and actually sped things up and whatnot. But um, those are great opportunities. So if, if your company allows people to do that. Google used to have the 20% time thing. Um, which I believe is how Gmail came about. So Gmail was at 20% time. Um, it's now uh, one of their primary, one of their primary money makers slash you know everybody uses Gmail. Um, so give people the opportunity to do things like that. So that's one way of actually opening up your organization, um, and you will find some amazing stuff that come out of that. Yeah, they always say after hours is when wealth is created. Yes. You know? <laughs> or, I'm too busy working to get rich. Well, you know, find the time. Put in your time, and if you're doing 60, 
the boss may like it for the current time, but they forget. And it turns into a situation of what have you done for me lately? So work for yourself first. Any other questions or personal stories? Beautiful. All right. Thank you. I'm going to call.